Welcome back to the channel. Today, we've got a great video for you talking about everything you need to know for Fantasy Football Week 3. We're going to start off with a little bit of sell highs and buy lows. And firstly, we'll start off with the sell highs. And my first name on this list is Zach Moss. Now, I'm a big fan of what Zach Moss has been able to do so far. He's looked really impressive in his two games he's played with the Colts. But the one thing to note with him is Jonathan Taylor is still on the Colts. If Jonathan Taylor gets traded, then Zach Moss is a great piece to have. He's a RB2 potential going forward for the rest of the season. But if Jonathan Taylor does not get traded and plays for the Colts, he becomes a handcuff, and that's all he is. So after back-to-back 20-point performances, you can probably get a pretty good haul for a guy like Zach Moss, and it might not be the worst thing to look into. However, you do want to keep your eye on Jonathan Taylor. If you start to see some rumors peak up about Taylor getting traded, then maybe it might be worth to hold on to him or go after and trade for him. But right now, I'd be cautious, and I think I would sell high after two good weeks from Zach Moss. Now, the second name is Jarek McKinnon, and this is a guy I would not be so cautious with. I think if you've got him, trade him now. Uh, He had 17 points last week. Great performance, but... He played 29% of the snaps for the Chiefs last week. He is an obvious RB2 to Isaiah Pacheco. And we've even seen Clyde Edwards-Hilaire getting a little bit more workload this season. So McKinnon is not reliable. Scored two touchdowns. He only had five touches last game. That's just not reliable. If you can find a guy who's even willing to give you a solid bench depth piece that you might be able to start or some high upside players, do it because McKinnon is not a sustainable player. He will not be putting up these points week in and week out. That's just how it is with him. Now, the next two names are sort of in similar situations where you might not want to just jump the gun and sell them instantly, but it might not be the worst thing to look into some trade offers you could get for these two. Starting with Jerome Ford, he's been great since the career, or sorry, since the Nick Chubb injury. 24 points against Pittsburgh, 19 points against Tennessee. So he's been very efficient, very good, a very good runner. But they did just bring in Kareem Hunt. He's a guy familiar with the offense. Obviously, they didn't have full faith in Jerome Ford because otherwise they just wouldn't have brought in Kareem Hunt. So there are some question marks within the organization. He also played 49% of the snaps in the game uh, Nick Chubb went down. And he only played 56% last week. So again, a little bit worrying. You'd want to, you'd want to see an RB1 like that play a little bit more percentage of the snaps. And then they're bringing in Kareem Hunt, a guy who can very, very easily take snaps and especially take away snaps in the receiving game where you might lose a lot of points. So not necessarily need to sell him right now, but if you get a good offer, I would not be afraid to uh, move on from Jerome Ford. And sort of a similar thing with Alexander Madison. The Vikings, again, obviously didn't have full faith in Madison. They brought in Cam Akers, traded assets to go and get him. And he's a guy who's worked with Kevin O'Connell, the head coach before. So Kevin O'Connell knows him. Kevin O'Connell obviously likes him. Something to keep an eye on. And the other thing is, Madison does not look so impressive so far. He had a good week last week. 80% of the snaps, 20 rushing attempts for 93 yards, 5 catches on 7 receptions. It's a pretty good outing. 17.5 points with no touchdowns. That's a pretty solid outing for an RB2 level guy. But the week before that, he had 5 points. He had a fumble loss. He's had some bad fumble uh, ball control issues in his career. A little bit of a risky play. You can keep him. You can hold on to him and see how it all pans out. But I would expect that they might go to a bit of a split backfield with Cam Akers and the team once he gets a little bit more familiar with that offense. Now we're going to move on to some buy low options. Uh, First up is Jameer Gibbs. I'm a big fan of Jameer Gibbs, but he's been very underwhelming to start out the year. 8 fantasy points week 1, 12.6 week 2, and 9.2 week 3. So it's been a little bit concerning, especially that week 3, there was no David Montgomery. So he had full control of the backfield yet they still seemed cautious using him all the time. He only played 60% of the snaps, but 17 attempts for 80 yards, pretty efficient numbers, and we didn't see much in the receiving game last week, which is something I would expect to see that increase over week in, week out for Jameer Gibbs, because that's his, that's his specialty. That's his bread and butter. He's a great receiving back. But the thing to note with Jameer Gibbs, as much as his snap share is still down, his workload is still kind of down, it's been getting better. 27% snap share week one, 48% week two, and 60% week three. So it's getting there. And Dan Campbell has said on multiple occasions, they're easing him in. They don't want to rush him. They just want to have him ease into the offense, let him get comfortable. Then he'll be set to explode. And I think once he takes off, he is going to be a great, possibly RB1 option for a lot of teams in fantasy football. So he's a guy that if your league mates get a little cautious on him, doesn't feel a little concerned about his production, go after him. He's a great buy low option this week. 
Number two on the list, Trevor Lawrence. If you're looking for a quarterback, I think Trevor Lawrence might be the best option to go out and try and trade for. Uh, he's He hasn't been great, but he started out slow last year too. Uh, and it's it's sort of just a thing. He'll get better. He'll keep getting better. We've seen what a talented quarterback Trevor Lawrence is. We've seen this last year. He was just a great elite quarterback. Maybe not fantasy football wise, but for fantasy football, he's a great QB one. You can rely on him week in, week out. And back-to-back, under 15-point performances looks a little questionable, but I think he will turn it around. There's not It's harder to go on the stats when it comes to quarterbacks. It's just kind of a gut feeling. you got to rely on the talent with a guy like Trevor Lawrence. Extremely talented quarterback. You would expect to see these numbers take a jump up in the next couple of weeks. And then after that, we have Calvin Ridley, his receiver. And I expect as Trevor Lawrence continues to improve and get comfortable with Calvin Ridley, Ridley's numbers will go up. And the important thing to note with Ridley is the workload has been there. 11 targets week one, eight targets week two, seven targets week three. So it's been a bit of a decline, but the target share is still there. You see that this, they're trying to work him into the offense. He had a PI touchdown called back against the Texans. That lost him a lot of points. So he's a really, really talented receiver. And the biggest question mark for Ridley heading into the season was would he be able, would he be rusty? Would he be able to keep up these days after taking almost a full year and a half off of football? And so far the answer has been yes. He hasn't looked slow. He hasn't looked underwhelming for say. He's just been been kind of unlucky so far when it comes to uncatchable balls, PI calls, all that sort of stuff. So I would expect him to return to what he did in week one where he had 24 points very, very soon. The last name on this list is Daniel Jones, and he is a tough one because as an actual real NFL quarterback, he's just not very good. We've seen it before. The stuff isn't there. The processing isn't there. We know all that, but that is not relevant when it comes to fantasy football, especially for a guy like Daniel Jones, because yeah, he doesn't process the field the best. He's not the most accurate, that's to say the least, but he can run. And in fantasy football, that it's worth a lot if you're a quarterback. Uh, he had 13 rushing attempts week one against Dallas, nine rushing attempts week two against Arizona, plus a touchdown. That's important to note, especially with Saquon Barkley out. He almost becomes the primary rushing option in the red zone to get those touchdowns. So a weak performance against one of the best defenses in football, and then his only other weak performance from the season was against one of the other best defenses in all of football, Dallas, and then San Francisco last week. So I would expect to bounce back against a defense like Seattle's next week. I think now's the time to go out and try and pick up Daniel Jones if you're looking for a quarterback because the rushing upside is always there. And that's something, you, something that would really benefit you in fantasy football is having a quarterback that can use his legs, get those points, get the touchdowns from that over someone who's purely a pocket passer. Daniel Jones has that advantage, and I expect a bounce back this week. Moving on now to our next fantasy football segment, and that is the waiver wire. A little bit late this week, sort of just an unfortunate scheduling thing on my side. Uh, but we will, if these players are still available, I would still recommend going out and get them. Some of them might not be, but I'll try and get these out before the waiver wires go through next time. But we'll start off Devon Achan, uh, not Achan. He said he wanted Achan after his monster performance last week, 51 points. Actually, in most leagues, he's probably no longer there for you. But if he is, pick him up. I mean, I was a big fan of him in the pre-draft process. I thought he could overtake Mostert because he's just a younger, more talented back than Mostert. Very fast, fits that Dolphins running gun type of offense. Um, so he's a great pickup if for, for most people at running back. He will not be putting up 50 points every week, but it is he will be a good running back, and I think he can improve his workload. As After this performance, I think he'll continue to get more and more and more snaps, and I think he's a potential to overtake Raheem Mostert in that Dolphins backfield. It won't happen right away, but it is worth worth considering that he can do that. And he was only owned in 46% of the leagues heading into the waiver period. So there's a chance he's still available. Go out and pick him up. He's a good long-term hold option uh, for most teams. Now, next up, we have Nathaniel Tank Dell. Uh, Tank Dell, only owned in 48% of the leagues. He's been great. I really love what I've seen from this guy so far. 20 points in week two, 25 points in week three. He's a great deep ball threat for just or for CJ Stroud to attack, and they love using him. He's He caught some great passes. He's got tons of skill, tons of speed, got great hands. What more can you ask for in a young receiver? And it's also a case he was only drafted in the fourth round, but volume over talent sometimes when it comes in fantasy football, and Tank Dell is getting volume. 10 targets week two, seven targets week three. 
he continues to find himself, find a way into this offense, especially with the injury to Noah Brown for the Texans. Tank Dell seems to have taken over, and I don't see him giving up that spot anytime soon. And the other option, the next option is CJ Stroud, Tank Dell's quarterback. If you're needing a quarterback, this is a guy to go out and get. He he's looked really solid so far. 21 points week two, 20 points week three. Just looked really, really steady. Doesn't turn the ball over a ton. He gets touchdowns. The, the Texans seem to be in more of a pass-heavy offense this season with Stroud behind the behind the helm. So that's something to look look at. 47 passing attempts in week two, 30 passing attempts in week three. I expect to see more of the same for the Texans moving forward. And CJ Stroud is a great option uh, to, to pick up if you're looking at a quarterback. And he's also a good option to hold as a backup because he can continue to break out. Maybe you could trade him to a team who is looking at uh, picking up a quarterback. Next up, we have Romeo Dobbs. Romeo Dobbs, he had a bit of an up and down start to the year, opened up with a great 18-point performance, but he only saw 48%, 48% of the snaps, five targets, four catches, but he had two touchdowns, which led to the great performance. But week in, week out, he's been getting more and more snaps, less touchdown dependent, and more getting good targets. Didn't have a great week last week, but this week, 18.3 fantasy points, 12 targets, only five catches which is kind of a tough uh, tough look. But Jordan Love is a the league leader in uncatchable passes so far, and that's something he'll just need to hone in on, a little bit of things he needs to improve as a young quarterback in the league. I expect that to be uh, tuned up heading into the next couple weeks. So that's something that you wouldn't shouldn't really be worried about when it comes to Romeo Dobbs. Any other touchdown he seems to be a pretty good red zone option for Jordan Love. I would definitely be looking into picking up Romeo Dobbs. Next up, another Green Bay Packers receiver, Jaden Reed. Didn't have a great week last week, but he's turned into a favorite target of uh, Jordan Love for sorts. Five targets week one, eight targets week two, seven targets week three. Isn't seeing a ton of snaps, but when he's on the field, Jordan Love seems to love targeting him, and he had two touchdowns in week two. He can be a good threat in the red zone. This is a guy they drafted from Michigan State. Very talented young receiver. I could see him making a way into his the regular snaps for this offense and becoming a more household name, per se, for the Packers wide receiver core and sort of moving his way up that depth chart as the season continues to go on. And another thing to note, he's seen a steady increase in snap share from week to week, so it should continue to go up if the trend continues. Now, next up, we have Joshua Palmer from the Chargers. This is a key, a Mike Williams injury replacement pickup. Only owned 5% of the league, so he should be available in your league. Potentially still available even after the late waiver claims. Um, but he even had a good week last week. 14.6 points, 7 targets, 4 catches, and a touchdown. So he even had a good week last week, and that was with Mike Williams playing the majority of the game. He seems to be the wide receiver 3 over the rookie Quinton Johnston, which is important to note because he then slots into that Mike Williams role. Maybe they'll switch it around. Quentin Johnson might fit that mold a little bit better. But it's safe to say Joshua Palmer will be seeing his name called in this offense a lot more down the stretch. And he's a good player to hold on to to sort of see where the Chargers offense is headed. And the next waiver claim is, as mentioned, Quentin Johnston, the rookie out of TCU. He's a very talented receiver, but has had a rough start to his career. Not getting a ton of snaps, not getting a ton of targets, not getting a ton of catches. Just kind of feels like another case of he's easing into the offense. You can't judge these rookies too quickly because oftentimes they break out in this week four, week five timeline. And when a spot opens up, like with this Mike Williams injury, expect Quinton Johnson to step up. Talented receiver, similar build to Mike Williams. I would expect him to sort of fit right in perfectly into that role. So he's a great option to pick up, especially if you are someone who had Mike Williams. You definitely want to pick these two guys up. And then finally... This is sort of a deeper pick. I, I wouldn't recommend him if you're in a 10-man league or even a 12-man league per se, but Marvin Mims is someone to keep an eye on. He's been a very, very impressive deep ball threat for Russell Wilson, the rookie out of Oklahoma. Um, he had he, he gets a lot of yardage on limited catches, so it's a very high-risk uh, pickup, but the reward can be high as well. High-risk, high reward for Marvin Mims. 20 points in Week 2, 16 points in Week 3. But as I mentioned, he only saw 24% of the snaps in both of those games. So he's got a he's got a great he's got a, he's a great deep threat it seems in this Broncos offense. And with the things stuff he's shown and with the Broncos struggling, 
maybe they look to use utilize him a little bit more in the offense. So maybe he's not a guy you pick up this week, but he's definitely someone I think you should keep an eye on moving forward on the waiver wires for all your leagues. Thank you all so much for watching my fantasy football guide video for this week, week number three. I'll be posting these videos weekly. I'll also be posting videos with a weekly NFL roundup for anything that went on in the real NFL world. That video should be up on my channel. Be sure to check it out for week three. I'll have more of these videos coming at you weekly. Thanks for watching.